All right, welcome back to ABA exam review in our BCBA exam practice question series, where we're going through our next set of questions together and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're turning, welcome back. Please like and subscribe. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for our study materials and the question bank. As always, when you pass, let us know so we can include you in our Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. Question one, Jason is doing his taxes. He is pondering what expenses he should include as part of his yearly deduction. He reads online that if he adds too many deductions, he will get audited. He has never gotten audited in the past, but Jason decides to limit his deductions anyways. What likely led to Jason limiting his deduction? Okay, let's observe Jason's behavior. And the behavior we're looking at is limiting his deduction. We know that he is trying to determine what he should deduct. And he reads that if he adds too many deductions, he's going to get audited. Now, he's never gotten audited in the past, but he limits deductions anyways. So what can we immediately eliminate? We can immediately eliminate contingency shape behavior. Why? Because contingency shape behavior says your behavior was either reinforced or punished in the past. It was shaped by a contingency. Jason's behavior is not shaped by a contingency. He's never done this thing in the past. He's never gotten audited in the past. So he has no contingency shape behavior to fall back on. What Jason is doing is following a rule. All he did was read online that if you add too many deductions, you're going to get audited. No contingency is in place for that for Jason at the time, but that rule says it. So what does Jason do? Well, he limits his deductions. And why? Is he escaping the audit? Or is he avoiding? Well, avoiding is preventing the presentation of the stimulus. Escape is when the stimulus is present and you get out of it. The audit has not happened. Jason is attempting to avoid that audit in the future. So Jason's behavior of limiting his deduction is going to be rule governed, he read online, avoidance, trying to prevent the audit from happening. For the last two weeks, Martha has put empty boxes near the street for trash pickup. However, the garbage men have yet to collect the boxes. This week, Martha puts the boxes on the other side of the road, and suddenly the garbage men take them. Martha now always puts the boxes on the other side of the road. What dimension of ABA does this scenario most reflect? Now, be careful, okay? We're looking at Martha's behavior, right? She put empty boxes near the street for trash pickup. Garbage men didn't collect. However, now she puts on the other side of the road. Now they take them. So now Martha's always putting the boxes on the other side of the road. She's established a relationship between where she puts the boxes and the garbage men picking them up. So what dimension of ABA does that reflect? A, conceptually systematic. Well, we don't really know if she's conceptually systematic. We're not sure really what behavior principle she used. If any, we just know she changed the location of her boxes, and now there appears to be some sort of functional relationship. B, technological. Martha might be repeating her intervention over and over. We, to, In order to be te technological, though, we need somebody else to come in and repeat or, or replicate or duplicate what Martha's done, okay? not just Martha herself. See, analytic, analytic says, well, we're looking at some sort of functional relation. Okay, Martha does one thing, something else happens. And that's true here. Depending on where she manipulates her boxes affects the behavior of the garbage men. So this is an analytic dimension. Okay, the scenario is analytic. Now, why D, experimentation? Martha seems to be experimenting, right? Well, the question asked about dimensions. And experimentation is not a dimension of ABA. You got to be very careful when dealing with the dimensions and assumptions and understandings. Don't get those confused. They're not the same thing. Okay, dimensions are from that that Bears Wolf and Risley article, seminal article. Okay, there's seven of them. You've got to know the difference. So we're talking about dimension it can't be experimentation. What it is is analytic though. There's some sort of functional relation going on when Martha manipulates her variables. The garbage men's behaviors change. So the dimension of ABA, the scenario most reflects, is C. Analytic. Several girls in a second grade class engage in hair pulling behavior. The second grade teacher, Miss Riley, notices that the girls will usually start twirling their hair right before they pull someone else's hair. Hair twirling would be considered a what? Now, 
think about this. Okay, we're looking at hair twirling. If you read the first sentence, they engage in hair pulling behavior. When does this hair twirling occur? Well, they usually start twirling their hair right before they pull someone else's hair. We're thinking antecedent here. Now, is this a rule? No, it's not a rule. The rule is not in place, right? It's not written down anywhere. It's not It's not shaping and changing and controlling behavior, okay? All Ms. Riley has done is notice that there's this antecedent of twirling hair, and then hair pulling happens. So when we notice something that occurs usually right before another behavior, it's an antecedent, but what specific type? Will be precursor. This hair twirling is a precursor to hair pulling. And if you've actually worked in practice, which most of you have, you can identify several precursors, right? You get good at identifying what behavior is going to lead to the next behavior, right? You identify these behaviors that signal you that another behavior is about to occur, right? Let's say a kid has meltdowns and the precursor to the meltdown is putting his head on the desk. Once we identify the precursor of putting the head on the desk, we can start to change and try to avoid the meltdowns. C, function. Hair twirling is not why the hair pulling is happening. Happening. Hair twirling is not a function. And then D, consequence. Well, it can't be a consequence because it comes before hair pulling. So hair twirling is simply a precursor to hair pulling. It happens before, and it's an indication that another behavior is about to occur. All of the following child or client behaviors are maintained by automatic reinforcement, which of the following examples does not represent extinction of behavior maintained by automatic reinforcement. A couple key points here. We are told behaviors are maintained by automatic reinforcement. So you know what the function is, right? The function is automatic reinforcement. You don't even have to think about that. The question is asking, which one does not represent extinction of automatic reinforcement? So you have to ask yourself, what does represent extinction of automatic reinforcement? Well, in order to put automatic reinforcement on extinction, you've got to block the sensation, right? You've got to block whatever sensation that automatic reinforcement is given, okay? It's, 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 it's essentially a self-reinforcement, right? So we're looking for a scenario that where we're not looking at extinction. A, a child who scratches himself until he bleeds wears a rubber glove which prevents the nail from contacting the skin. So the child is still able to scratch himself. He's just not bleeding. Okay, this could represent extinction of behavior maintained by automatic reinforcement. B, a mom turns her car window lock on to prevent her children from rolling down the windows repeatedly. So the kids, they can still attempt to roll down the window, but nothing's going to happen. Why? Because the windows are locked. The behavior can still occur. It's just not receiving reinforcement. If we compare that to C, a technician puts her hand over the light switch each time her client attempts to flick the switch on and off. C is response blocking. The technician is preventing the client from engaging in the response. Response blocking is not extinction. Got to remember that. Response blocking is not extinction. In B, the children can still engage in the behavior. Nothing happens. In C, the technician is preventing the behavior from occurring at all. To put a behavior on extinction, it has to occur. And then D, a client stomps his feet as loud as he can in the bathroom. So his dad put down a rug to dampen the sound. Okay, well, the client is, can still stomp his feet. There's just no reinforcement. A, B, and D, the behaviors are occurring. Extinction is happening. C, the behavior is being prevented from occurring. It's response blocking. And response blocking is not extinction. Joanna trains her technician on a home-based extinction procedure. The target behavior is asking for access to electronic device. Once the extinction procedure begins, the learner starts attempting to steal the electronic device or throw things in order to gain access. What best describes stealing and throwing things? Okay, back-to-back -back extinction questions. Might happen, might not. It's all random, right? We're not going to read too much into it. Questions asking about stealing and throwing things. So we know the target behavior is access to electronic device, right? Once the extinction procedure begins, though, now all of a sudden, the learner is trying to steal or throw things in order to gain access. Okay, so we've got these new behaviors emerging. And when new behaviors emerge, or new responses emerge from extinction, what do we call that? A, extinction burst. So be careful. An extinction burst is an increase in the frequency of the behavior on extinction. 
Okay. We're dealing with some new novel behaviors. So B, extinction induced variability is what really what we're looking at. Different responses as a result of extinction. C, spontaneous recovery occurs after extinction is done, right? Behavior comes back. D, resurgence is similar to spontaneous recovery, but resurgence occurs when the extinct behavior comes back because now the replacement behavior is also on extinction. So in other words, both behaviors, the replacement and the old behavior on extinction, behavior resurges. In spontaneous recovery, the only behavior on extinction is still the old one. Okay, a little confusing, but just think about it. Spontaneous recovery, only one behavior is on extinction, and resurgence, both are. But the question is asking about the stealing and throwing, and the stealing and throwing are considered extinction-induced variability. Slow evolutionary change over hundreds of years is considered what? All right, kind of a fluency question. When we talk about slow evolutionary change and how behavior is selected due to evolution, we are talking about phylogeny, okay? Phylogeny uh, is learning history. Cultural is kind of passed down verbally, right? Operant is what we deal with, our SRS, okay? Slow evolutionary change is considered phylogeny. A functional behavior assessment indicates that a differential reinforcement of other behaviors intervention would be most appropriate for treating the identified behavior. The identified behavior is nose picking. Which of the following DRO procedures should the behavior analyst not use? This is a very easy question if you know your stuff. DROs are designed to be to use what? DROs are designed to use interval schedules. They're time. Okay. If we are picking the DRO procedure that should not be used, if we look at A, fixed ratio, we're not going to use a fixed ratio with the DRO. A is out immediately. We could use a fixed interval DRO. We can use a variable interval DRO. We can use a momentary DRO. We cannot use a fixed ratio DRO. This is an example of a question that is easy, easy, easy. If you really know your fluency, it can be rather tricky if you don't. Okay, because there's no way to really work into this answer. You just kind of got to know it, right? So, which of the following DRO procedure should the behavior analyst not use? Well, a fixed ratio DRO, because DROs are done using interval schedules. A client has gotten very good at making his own meals. He is now able to make himself a sandwich or heat up items in the microwave. He can do these things independently, but follow specific steps each time. Today, his technician moves the bread from its usual location to a different location. What is the technician attempting? Think about what the technician is doing. He knows the client has gotten good at make his own, making his own meals. He can now make himself a sandwich or heat up items. He does them independently. So today, the technician changes it. He moves the bread, changes the step. What is that called? It's not forward or backwards chaining, right? Because forward or backwards chaining, we're actually teaching the chain in a certain way. It's not even total task chaining, because total task chaining, you're teaching all the steps. What he's doing, the technician, is a behavior chain interruption strategy, where you purposely interrupt the chain in order to evoke a novel behavior. By moving the bread from its usual location to a different location, the technician is hoping that a novel behavior will emerge. Fantastic. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials, including the question bank. Let us know when you pass. Work hard, study hard, see you soon.